Do you know the feeling when the low fuel light comes on in your car and you're pretty sure you'll make it to the next gas station in time? Something similar happened to a crew of an Airbus A310 a while ago, but unfortunately they did not make it to the next gas station. Find out why with me today as we take a look at the case of Hapagloid Flight 3378 that crashed in Vienna. Welcome to Airspace. In the morning hours of July 12, 2000, Hapagloid Flight 3378 took off from Chania, Greece, to Hanover, Germany. I'm sure the name of the airline doesn't ring a bell, as it was a small airline operating out of Germany at the time. Today it is known as TuiFly and is commonly seen around Europe sporting baby blue liveries. But back to our flight 3378. Just a minute after departure, the two pilots of the Airbus A310 recognized that something was not good. The right landing gear would apparently not come up and the right landing gear door remained open as well. They re-extended the landing gear again and thereafter tried to retract it once more. However, to no avail. This was repeated two more times, but after that, the pilots decided that the situation probably would not get better and continued on with the landing gear completely extended, since they did not know in what position the landing gear was exactly when it failed to retract. In the extended position, however, the landing gear would always lock in place nicely. In that configuration, the crew decided to continue onwards to their destination. The climb was slow and noisy due to the added drag that the landing gear produced. After the aircraft had reached its cruising altitude, the pilots noticed that their fuel would not suffice to bring them to their destination and therefore they decided that they would have to divert to another airport. Such a decision is often taken together with the operations department of the airline and thus the first officer tried to contact them via HF radio. But since the company radio receiver was out of service, it took him the better part of an hour to reach someone at the headquarters. After communications were finally established, it was decided to continue for a landing in Munich, southern Germany. Now, the flight management system indicated that the flight could reach Munich with fuel to spare. But not for long, as predictions started to decline steadily. Soon, the pilots realized that they would not make it to Munich either. Discussions about the nature of the predictions of the flight management system arose between the commander and the first officer, but they led to no specific insight. At that time, one hour of flight time had passed and the first officer decided to perform the required fuel check. During this check, fuel tank quantities and fuel burn are carefully checked against the flight plan to determine any discrepancies. What the first officer discovered should have rattled both pilots. They had burned 2.9 tons more than they had anticipated, that is 60% more than they would have burned during a regular flight. But still, the pilots decided that the flight management system must be right, even though they now wouldn't even make it to Munich. Instead, they now decided to fly to Vienna, here, in Austria. After they reprogrammed the flight management system, it showed that they could reach that destination. Meanwhile, the first officer found a chapter about special flight with landing gear down in the handbooks and proceeded to read it to the captain, but the latter was not interested and stated that this chapter only referred to flight planning and was of no use to them. After an hour and 34 minutes of flight, the aircraft was just next to Zagreb, Croatia, at that time, the flight management system indicated that the fuel at the destination would be below the legally required minimum of 2 tons. At this point, a diversion would have been in order, but the pilots did not react to the indication and pressed on towards Vienna. But while they were still in Croatian airspace, they contacted Vienna via their second radio set to let air traffic control know that they would require a straight-in approach because of a technical problem. Soon afterwards, the flight was handed off to Vienna Air Traffic Control and once again, the flight requested the shortest possible way to the runway. This prompted the controller to ask what the problem was, and only now, almost two hours after the occurrence of the problem, the pilot stated what the nature of it was. During the approach to Vienna, the fuel quantity on board became critically low, and the first officer prompted the captain to declare an emergency, as it would have been required long ago but the captain chose to press on and not to declare Mayday once more. As if to underline the first officer's statement, a warning about low fuel quantity lit up on the instrument panel. At this time, a diversion to Zagreb would still have been possible, but the flight continued on. Soon, the captain noticed that there were only 800 kilograms of fuel left in the tanks, mere minutes of engine power remaining. He now admitted that he was somewhat confused and again the first officer and he entered a discussion about the functioning principle of the flight management predictions. The captain now stated that he would delay the extension of the flaps to not produce even more drag. 
He also remained high on the glide slope so he would have enough altitude to glide down to the runway in case both engines were to fail. And soon after they did, almost simultaneously. Frantically, the first officer attempted to relight the engines and he succeeded, but only for a short time, since they now consumed every last drop of fuel that was left in the tanks. Powerless and without a complete flap setting, the Airbus A310 now glided towards the runway. For a while, it must have looked as if they were going to make it, but in the end, the plane struck the grass 660 meters before runway 34, left wing tip first, then with the left landing gear. It collapsed almost immediately and the plane slid along the ground on its left engine and right landing gear until it came to a halt between two taxiways leading to the runway after having destroyed several approach lights and the localizer antenna. Quickly the plane was evacuated. Everyone made it out alive, but 26 passengers were slightly injured. This very strange case was closely analyzed by the Austrian Accident Investigation Board. It would seem strange that the pilots pressed on so stubbornly knowing all too well that they had a problem with their landing gear and being aware that they would burn more fuel with the landing gear in the extended position. After takeoff, the right landing gear indicated correctly that it would not retract properly and the pilots believed that indication. They also realized that they had burned much more fuel than was normal as can be deduced from the fact that they consciously performed the required fuel check after one hour. So what led them to their decision to change their destination to an ever-decreasing distance while believing that the fuel predictions were right? To answer that, you have to take a look at this, the flight management system of the Airbus A310. Using this box, pilots feed all kind of data to the plane. Wind, weight, fuel load before departure and so on. In return, the flight management system provides optimizations and calculates time to destination and the fuel burn until there, as well as the remaining fuel at the destination, displayed here. A very useful feature, and I'm often puzzled by how exact the prediction models of this somewhat antique looking computer are. The thing is, these predictions are only accurate for standard situations or a very limited selection of failure cases, such as flight with a failed engine. For all other cases, the flight management system keeps assuming the standard model and pilots have to consult other sources to determine their actual fuel burn and projected endurance. One such source is the manual provided by Airbus. For flight with landing gear down, there were tables that indicated the fuel burn at various altitudes up to 29,000 feet. The crew of flight 3378 however climbed to 31,000 feet, where no further predictions were available. The investigation discovered that the two pilots discussed whether the flight management system would consider the extended landing gear in its calculations. The first officer leaned towards no, but the captain was convinced that it would. A fundamental misconception. It is striking that the crew did not realize the predicament for over 90 minutes. The glance at the current fuel burn per minute, which is displayed to the pilots via the normal instruments, combined with a quick check against remaining fly time, would have easily revealed that the remaining fuel would not take them to either of the destinations. It might surprise some that the extended landing gear had such an impact on fuel burn, but if you look at an airplane in flight, it becomes apparent why that is. Everything on a plane is smooth, rounded and aerodynamically optimized. Newer planes like the A350 even use curved glass windows to reduce drag that a normal, flat, square window would provide. If you then imagine dragging a clunky, unoptimized shape of steel and rubber that is the landing gear through the air at half the speed of sound, it quickly becomes apparent just how much energy that would use. I couldn't find the manual page for the A310, but if you look at the documentation for the A320, it states that flight with landing gear down increases fuel burn by a whopping 180%. One more question remains to be answered. Why couldn't the landing gear be retracted? As it turns out, the answer is rather anticlimactic. During a previous maintenance action on the landing gear, a lock nut on the landing gear adjustment part was inadequately secured. Hence, it could turn ever so slightly during the next 2000 landing gear cycles that followed, elongating the adjustment by fractions of a millimeter each time. On flight 3378, this adjustment finally got out of range after the part had elongated by about a centimeter, that is 0.4 inches. With that elongated part in play, the landing gear could not be retracted properly anymore. In the end, this case was another instance of pilots trusting their computers way too much and not thinking for themselves. While the investigation also discovered pitfalls in Airbus's documentation, it noted that the pilots clearly didn't follow normal fuel monitoring practices. These lapses resulted in the emergency landing and partial destruction of the plane. It was damaged beyond repair and had to be written off. The courts revoked the captain's license. 
He was also convicted of dangerous interference with civil air traffic and received a six month suspended prison sentence. Thank you very much for watching. I hope you liked this week's video. Make sure to subscribe so you won't miss any future episodes. See you next week.